Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. Hello everyone, welcome back to Talking Tudors episode 35. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. As always, a huge thank you to the wonderful patrons who continue to support this podcast. I'm so very grateful for each and every one of you. A full list of patrons is available on my website under the Patrons tab. If you love Talking Tudors and would like to show your appreciation and support the work I do, just click on the Be My Patron on Podbean badge on the homepage of my website, www www.onthetutortrail.com or click on the Be a Patron button on the Podbean app. Join the Talking Tutors patron family before the end of June and you'll be automatically entered into our patron-only monthly giveaways. June's prize is a copy of Owen, book one of the Tudor trilogy by Tony Richards. A huge thank you to Tony for sponsoring this wonderful prize. Check out his other great books at tonyriches.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm delighted that joining me on the show to talk about Prince Arthur Tudor, Henry VII, and much more is Dr. Sean Cunningham. Dr. Cunningham is head of the Medieval Records team at the UK National Archives, where he's worked for 20 years, time only just to scratch the surface of the medieval and Tudor collections. His main interest is British history in the period circa 1450 to 1558. Sean has published many studies of politics, society and warfare, especially in the early Tudor period, including Henry VII and Prince Arthur, the Tudor king who never was. He has recently been involved in the Tudor Chamber Books project and is co-writing with James Ross a related book on projection and reception of Tudor kingship, 1485 to 1529. He is a fellow of the Royal Historical Society and co-convener of the late medieval seminar at London's Institute of Historical Research. My conversation with Sean straight after this short musical break, courtesy of guitarist John Sales. Welcome to Talking Tudors, Sean. How are you? I'm very well, Natalie. Thank you very much for asking me. Yes, I'm very excited. Can't wait for our conversation, actually. Um, I'd like to begin by you just telling us a little bit about yourself and your background, please. Well, I've been working at the the National Archives, as it was a public record office, Mm -hmm. for about 20 years, which is a long time. (laughs) But I feel like there's been a lot of people there before me, and we're really just beginning to scratch the surface of what's there um, in terms of opportunities to do research and Um, how exciting it is to get into the records. So the sort of love of history and the love of the records has really come together in my job. I feel very lucky that I can can spend my days digging through the past like that. 
um, and making discoveries almost every day, as most of my colleagues do as well. So it's a great place to be. So, yes, I've always had a, a real interest in this period of history. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess I studied medieval history at university and really was drawn to the sort of Richard III, Henry VII controversy. Yes. Um, and that really sparked my interest in, in what the, the truth or what the, the real detail of that period was. Mm-hmm. And I guess from there, it's just been a question of, of taking more steps and getting into different levels of, of records and, and other researchers' work. So really trying to, to get more detail um, and spread that around for everyone to see. Fabulous. And yeah, I'm not jealous at all that you work with all those wonderful documents. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've written a book entitled Prince Arthur, The Tudor King Who Never Was. What drew you to Arthur's story in particular? It's one of those, um, I guess it's sort of a missing piece in the jigsaw. Um, yeah. Right at the start of the Tudor period, you think, well, Henry VII comes to the throne. He's desperate for an heir to begin to secure things, to draw people together around the new regime to try and make everyone's loyalty to him rather than to perhaps what they had in the past. So mm-hmm. Prince Arthur was a, a central figure in in drawing the sort of identity of the Tudors into more focus. But he'd never really been studied. There was not a lot of detail about him. Yeah. And I wondered whether that was because it didn't exist mm-hmm. or if people hadn't tried to look for it. So to think about all of the the things Prince Arthur carried with him, the responsibilities and the expectations, I felt he deserved a bit more of an investigation and mm. beginning to look for it, it, there was quite a lot of stuff there. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the, um, the information I found was around the set pieces of his christening and his marriage and his investiture as Prince of Wales. But digging a bit more into the into the actual government records and the local records for where he was, was living, there was quite a lot more to say about him. So I felt there was enough there to bring him into the spotlight a bit. And having done that, you can really see how his life set the Tudor regime on a particular course and how it mm. drew the family strength together. And obviously when he um, when he died before he could become king, but just on the cusp of, of adulthood at 15 and a half, mm-hmm. um, it really threw everything out of order that had been planned for the previous 15 years. And I think that's a really important basis for what happens in the rest of the, the Tudor century. Some of it is a reaction to Arthur's death and what had to be then reworked and accommodated around that but also what then that allowed the king and then Henry VIII to, to take from Arthur's life and death as a sort of inspiration or memorial. So he's a very interesting character, and hopefully I've, I've put a bit more colour into his uh, into his life so people can actually see how, how he fits into the story a bit more. Yeah, absolutely, and I think he's one of the, the sort of greatest what-ifs of the Tudor dynasty as well. <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Now, a lot of what we know about Henry VIII, um, we, well, we know that he was raised in a sort of feminine household, and according to various historians, he's, you know, his mother taught him how to write and, and possibly how to read and those sorts of things. Do we know much about Arthur's upbringing? There's quite a lot of, of material evidence of supplying his household with clothing and paying the servants mm-hmm. and repairing the buildings. So you can, you can rebuild some of the context for his life. Occasionally you see gifts being given to him, like he got a a longbow when he was about five from the king. Um, You can see evidence of of wine and an increasing kind of adult household around him as he got older. He he was separated from the rest of the family when he was very young, about two or three weeks old. He went to live at Farnham, um, which is down in in Hampshire, in Wiltshire, um, away from London. So he's given his own household quite early on and brought up entirely separately obviously near enough for visits but not surrounded by his family so that's obviously an intention to give him a a sense of identity and independence Um, and then we have to look for what is then supplied to his household who is serving him um, a little bit of 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 evidence of of royal visits but not too much and he lives there for i guess for five years Yes, and then he's moved to um, moved to Ludlow, which is mm-hmm. the traditional training ground of the, the Princes of Wales under under the Yorkists. Uh, if you can have a tradition from the fourteen sixties, but yeah. linking back into that connection with the the Mortimer family, which um, which Edward V had, and before him his father um, Edward IV when he was Earl of March. So Henry the Seventh is trying to make Arthur assume this identity as a as a great March lord, where he could learn to be a king in his own right by having responsibility for an area of land and running the law and dealing with people as a, as a great lord would do through his court um, mm-hmm. and his household. So he's, he's training him to be a king by giving him independent authority at a, quite a young age. 
And we, we can see a bit of that in the evidence of how the council works and the records of how his estates were managed. But again, it's all, it's quite patchy and indistinct. Right. Occasionally he pops up in different places where mm. he's writing letters. Or you see evidence of other people's records where Prince Arthur has just been for a visit and they give you some little snapshot of how impressed they were by his bearing or his conversation or his education. But it's quite a thing to draw it all together to create a, a solid picture of him. I think he's still quite a, a wispy, smoky character. Yeah. Almost um, appears and then disappears from the scene. You know, he's not he's not there constantly. Um, and you don't get a sense of development from, from week to week almost. Right. Which okay. you see with some of the other children who were brought up at Eltham or at, um, at Westminster. So I think it's difficult to to see the transitions in Arthur's life from from baby, infant a young person then teenager and all of the different changes of responsibility and, and interest that he would have had it's just these occasional glimpses which give you some sort of sense of how he was fitting in with traditional expectations um was he ever enjoying himself was he ever free mm. of this burden of being the next king um it's, it's always a bit of educated guessing to, to sort of put some of that information back into the story but i think um there's enough there to say that he was certainly trained to be a king and yes. know her that from, from a testimony from his schoolmaster Bernard Andre who was Henry the Seventh's um, official court poet he wrote a long almost like a CV for himself by saying how um, how brilliantly he'd educated Prince Arthur <laughs> right. how he could read and memorized all of these classic texts um, a lot of them Roman and Greek texts yeah. which had recently been rediscovered and printed um, at the end of the 15th century um, so he was was given all of these books and he was a brilliant student, apparently. So if we can believe that kind of evidence, then he was taught to be a practical leader, but also was given the kind of classroom education and training in rhetoric and oratory, which you'd expect a, a great king to, to be able to display. So I think Henry VII and his team that had tried to educate Arthur certainly thought about a rounded education and an upbringing which dealt with all of the aspects of what kings were expected to do. So there was an awful lot hanging on Prince Arthur's future, mm. I guess. And they invested a huge amount of time in giving him resilience and actually independence, but also making sure he was a, a fairly decent person. So I think um, the glimpses of his personality we get suggest that was possibly you know, coming through by the time he was 14, 15. But certainly when we get to his wedding, yeah. um, he really is is very obviously someone who can carry himself um, with the, the bearing and deportment of a, of a king and bear this responsibility of of what his family had planned for him, which was to take on this massive alliance with Spain and actually take England forward as a really powerful European country. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that alliance because I wanted to ask you about how Arthur and Catherine of Aragon's uh, marriage actually came about. So when did those negotiations begin? I think they started really, really quickly after Arthur was born, right. almost before the end of 1486. And I wondered whether there was actually some involvement of the Spanish in, in putting Henry VII on the throne in the first place. Right, okay. Because there's, a, there's a, massive, um, a massive concession to Spanish merchants even before the end of 1485. They can bring all of their goods into London without paying customs duty. And that's mm. the same sort of time that Henry is... You know, hoping that his his wife is pregnant and that Elizabeth and he are going to have a, a son who can take things forward for the whole family. So there's a there's an element of starting the negotiations almost before Arthur's born. Right. And when he is born, uh, which was a gamble in itself, things are already in place to make this work. So I think even though the the agreement um, for the marriage doesn't formally happen till much later, till 1489, I think they've actually already been talking about it for a long time. Um, and that takes a lot of negotiation and all, in the process of the negotiation they're actually strengthening the connection with Spain so there's obviously their children and they have to wait for quite a long time till the yeah. marriage could be considered to happen in reality and there's lots of proxy weddings and ambassadors visits and I think they have quite a few journeys to Ludlow to look at the um, at the region and see what the, the accommodation is like right <laughs> Prince Arthur's kind of uh, network will be and how they're going to look after him. So by the time, you know, they get to be 14 and 15, I think um, they're pretty much ready to be married in, in the sense of uniting the families. But obviously there's a, a political dimension which has to be thought about because Henry VII has been plagued by rebellions and pretenders mm. pretty much all the way through from 1486 
and obviously with Lambert Simnel and Perkin Warbeck yes. as kind of vehicles for much more complicated conspiracies and attempts to undermine Tudor power. I think the Spanish were very concerned they would be sending their precious daughter to a country which wasn't very stable, yeah. where yeah. there was the possibility of another dethronement, um, and they didn't want her to be in that position. So there's quite a lot of pressure, perhaps through these diplomatic and commercial links, to make Henry um, focus hard on eradicating his opponents. And obviously in 1499, we get um, the end of Edward, Earl of Warwick, who's mm -hmm. really the the main threat all the way through this, even though he's locked up in prison, he's a sort of magnet for people with, a, with an older loyalty to the Plantagenet line. Yeah. And he is obviously uh, a candidate who has got the power to draw people around himself, whether he's actually doing that himself or if um, that's been done in his name. Uh, eventually, there is a, a way of, um, of taking him out of the picture. So he's, he's caught up in um, the final stages of Perkin Warbeck's conspiracy. That's right. One, yeah. But once he's educated, right at the end of the, the 15th century, um, the way is clear for the, the wedding to happen. So the political dimension, the personal dimension is not really in the picture as far as Arthur and Catherine are concerned until yeah. that point. There's a few letters surviving um, in the British Library which show a kind of formal communication. Yes, yeah. And, and Arthur's are obviously, some of them are in, in Spain, in the Spanish archives. But as soon as the marriage is, um, I guess, on the cards, you see a little bit more personality coming into their correspondence. And when they eventually meet after Catherine has landed, um, Arthur's kind of blown away by her beauty yeah. and begins to, to write very effusively back to um, to Ferdinand and Isabella. So I think they, as, as far as teenagers could, sort of fall in love sight, having been primed to be in love all this time, yeah, I think it, right. it did look like it was a, a happy arrangement when it actually came to pass. Okay, great. Now, what do we know of Arthur's overall health? Is there any sort of contemporary evidence to, to substantiate the claims that I've heard here and there that he was a sickly young man? I think it's, again, it's tricky and mm. difficult to, to wade through the, the evidence that is patchy, as I said, and, yeah. and try and find that real evidence. We've got no household records which would show, you know, purchases of apothecaries, drugs or treatments by doctors. Right. Um, there's nothing really to show how he set up his chambers um, at Ludlow. Um, all of that material hasn't been found yet, if it exists or it's been lost. So we've got very little to go on other than the occasional report. Um, but the fact that he's he's riding around his his domain in mm -hmm. the marches, he pops up in Chester, he pops up in the Earl of Shrewsbury's household, he'll be down in Gloucester. Um, he's not static he's not stuck in his chambers he's out and about um he's running his courts mm -hmm. he's actively writing to very senior people with the authority of a prince i think he sends um sir gilbert talbot one of henry the seventh's right hand men a very stern letter about um how he's failed to do his his service to him right. um so so arthur's not a, a shrinking violet and i think for that reason he's he's probably fairly healthy right. and we know right up to his um the period of his, his final illness, which seems to have only lasted a few days. He mm -hmm. was performing the, the Monday service um, in Ludlow, you know, a week before he died. So the evidence of him sort of in some sort of lingering illness um, isn't really there, certainly not in the same way as someone like Edward VI, who is seen to be um, degenerating um, when he is witnessed by observers in London. You know, he, he, yeah. he looks deathly ill until he does die. So Arthur's, there's no evidence of Arthur appearing to be ill there's some strange, slightly strange comments in the, the Herald's accounts of his of his funeral, which um, you could interpret as a kind of evidence of disease. But um, I think either it was hidden very well and there was no comment raised, mm. or um, there wasn't really much to see because it was. It seems to be quite a sudden end, and I think the likeliest cause is um, an outbreak of the sweating sickness, um, which did yeah. occur in the region um, where he was living around Worcester. Um, at that sort of time so he may be just have been a high profile victim of a, an epidemic um, mm -hmm. which I think does explain some of his brother's Henry's kind of fear of, of disease later on mm -hmm. um, having seen yeah. his brother um, in a way that everyone was vulnerable to there was no sort of insulation um, against these things if you were mm -hmm. a member of royalty or if you were just a, a much lower born person so no, it could strike true. anyone down I think for that reason, um, 
we have to look to that kind of explanation rather than a a, a permanent mm-hmm. illness or a of disability of some sort. Yeah, definitely. And I think when we take into account that Catherine also fell ill, that totally makes sense, doesn't it? That it was some sort of contagious, um, you know, plague type thing coming through. I think so. And she certainly had um, an assigned role in the funeral procession from Ludlow to Worcester Priory. Mm -hmm. um, But she seems to have been too ill to actually take part. So she may have actually had um, the same illness, but but recovered. Um, So it's, yeah, it was a pretty slender... Um, a slender chance that any of them survived, really. I know, quite amazing. Now, obviously, Arthur's death had, you know, a devastating effect and impact on his parents and, and all that sort of thing. But what, what kind of effect do you think it had on Arthur's um, younger brother, Henry? You've already sort of mentioned it may have had something to do with the paranoia he later had about getting sick. But uh, do you want yes. to just sort of go into that a little bit more? I think this is a fascinating thing because I, I guess they didn't really have much contact. Yeah, no, um, that's right. Henry's living at Eltham and then living at Westminster um, with his sisters and and Prince Edmund when he's born. Um, so he's around younger children. Mm-hmm. Uh, Arthur is this this almost mythical figure of of self sort of um, almost mythical figure of, of of personal power already as a as a. Mm-hmm. I, think I guess he's what he's. Um, He's about four years older than Henry, mm-hmm. so he's he's somebody that Henry might look up to because he's already um, living this independent life. He's already learning how to make tough decisions and big decisions with the people he's engaged with and, and lord of. Mm-hmm. Whereas Henry seems to have a much narrower focus, um, perhaps as an element of jealousy about the expansiveness of Arthur's power, even as a as a young man. Um, and they would have seen each other on on state occasions, right. but for most of those, Henry wouldn't probably have had much of a memory. Mm-hmm. Um, when Arthur made Prince of Wales in 1489, Henry's not born. Um, he doesn't really. He would have seen him at at some events, but um, it would have been a very fleeting visit to London. Mm-hmm. And I think there's no evidence of of the royal family um, decamping to Ludlow for any length of time. I mean, there might have been the occasional visit, but I think the whole point of having a separate household for Prince Arthur was almost an insurance policy to to keep the princes and the royal children um, safe and secure, but also mm-hmm. to give the possibility that if things did go wrong, there was a centre, a second centre of power that could resist or fight back against any kind of invasion or plot, right. which might have accelerated to the point of, of pushing the kings out of power. So the, the sense of, um, of closeness, I think um, it's not really there. Mm-hmm. I think when... When Arthur is married in, in 1501, Henry's a ten year old and he um the the Herald's accounts of the of the of the wedding feast um and the dancing afterwards show him as being determined to be the centre of attention. Yeah. <laughs> he takes off his jacket and is dancing very wildly and that's reported in the accounts. So he does um he doesn't know how to behave like a courtier, certainly. Mm. Um but Arthur is in a different level, he's almost passed beyond that into the realm of a uh, a kingly figure. Yeah. So I'm sure Henry looked up to him, um, and we know that he kept a portrait of Arthur and some of his clothes, and maybe um, certainly some of the books that he'd had. So there's a there's a connection there as as Arthur as a, a figure to be um, admired and revered to some extent. But I think um, I think Henry perhaps was a bit alarmed when he was suddenly thrust into this role of yes. being Prince of Wales. <gasps> When he hadn't expected that, he hadn't mm. really been trained to the same extent. Mm-hmm. Um, there's some evidence of him being taken along to watch court proceedings at the court of the household, um, the court of the verge. There's a, a sort of 12 mile radius around the court where they can hold things like coroner's inquests. And I think Henry pops up in some of the records um, sitting alongside Lord Willoughby to, to see what's going on aged right. about 10 or 11. So he's been introduced to some of the harder, more boring aspects of being a, a royal leader. Um, but I think he certainly enjoys the tournament and the company of his friends far more. And we see that much more strongly when he is Prince of Wales um, after 1502. Arthur is is in the background as a, as a memory and perhaps it's some sort of inspiration for Henry. But Henry is having to take on all these other aspects of his, his role, which uh, he hadn't been prepared for. And to some extent, he... He rails against a little bit. He becomes a bit of a tearaway teen for his parents. Yeah. Um, and when he's he's given sort of he's given Kennington Palace as a sort of place to begin to 
to learn how to um to joust mm -hmm. and uh, to do uh, those man manly pursuits for which he's much more famous later on gotcha. um he turns that into a bit of a a young boys club i think where they they go and hide away and have a, a bit of a wild time so arthur is not um somebody who's who's there with henry when he's old enough to have been i guess inspired to behave like him right. henry is already in it off on a different direction and it's really when um elizabeth of york when the queen dies in 150 um 1503 mm -hmm. that we see henry's um reaction which is in the Vor the vox um it's the Vaux um, manuscript at the yeah, National yeah. of Wales, which mm -hmm. was fairly recently found, of um, what seems to be a, a weeping prince in the background with his sisters yeah. in mourning. Um, that seems to have a far stronger impact on, on Henry than his brother dying, which mm -hmm. is the, the death of his mother. Because right. that obviously he's been around that household. If she has, as is quite well evidenced, taught um, taught them to play instruments and to, mm -hmm. um, and to read and been involved much more closely in their education that's a closer relationship than, than Henry had with Arthur. So there's uh, perhaps an element of um, the fact that Arthur's died, um, Henry's in this new role, the king and queen decide to have a, another child mm -hmm. um, at a fa fairly advanced age for the time. Yeah. Um, and so that ends in tragedy. Um, and then Henry has to deal with that in, the, in a, at a time when his father is really retreating from his previous role in his in his um, in his grief, you know, Henry the Seventh disappears into his chamber for ten days or so, and is right. not seen by anyone. Mm. Um, and that's, I think, far more impactful on on Henry the Prince than um, than his brother dying. He's really just a he's already a distant figure when when Arthur dies, um, and Henry hasn't really seen the the evidence of how Arthur has built his power um, because it's it's so distant and mm. it's so much an investment for the future. It's almost a a microcosm of the national responsibility Arthur's going to have. So Henry hasn't had to really deal with any of that. And I'm not sure how much of that Henry has to pick up when he is Prince of Wales. I get the sense of a, a coming together of people just to get the regime over the line so that when Henry the Seventh does eventually die, everything is in good order for the for Prince Henry to take control. Right. Um, and that happens when he's, you know, 17 and a half. So he's still quite young when he becomes king. Yeah. And it really is a, a very narrow achievement to get, um, you know, the second Tudor king on the throne without any kind of opposition, mm -hmm. bearing in mind what had happened right through the 15th century when the regimes were in this kind of position of, of dangerous successions and plotters in the background. And for the Tudors who had recently arrived on the throne, it was um, it was quite a... A dangerous time the first transition to a new king so i think arthur arthur's there as some sort of inspiration perhaps mm -hmm. or maybe as a as a memory of what henry could aspire to be um without actually putting in the work yeah <laughs> um, but it's yeah it's one of those things where you think if they if they had more time together yeah i'm sure they could have actually you know, giving each other some sort of comfort and support, but it just wasn't the way things were done in terms of how princes had to learn to be kings. Mm. Um, they'd both taken different routes, and Arthur's the one who didn't get to exercise his power, but he was—he seems to be more fully equipped yeah. to discharge it, whereas Henry had to learn on the job mm -hmm. <laughs> readily. And for that reason, he's doing much more um, of what spectacular medieval kings had done, which was yes. investment in the magnificence and the warfare yeah. and the projection of power whereas I think Arthur would have been much more into the mechanics of how government worked and right. how he could control things and people a bit more like his father had been mm -hmm. but perhaps with slightly looser restraints because as the regime strengthened and, and progressed there was less need to be constantly vigilant mm -hmm. um, certainly by the time Arthur's married the expectation is he'd take a much stronger role in, in national power the fact that they were allowed to go back to Ludlow as, as a married couple, uh, Arthur and Catherine, I think that suggests that they were already thinking of a much more prominent role for Arthur and and his wife and right. perhaps a small child, which hopefully they were all wishing for an announcement early in 1503 that Catherine would be pregnant. Mm -hmm. But that didn't happen either. So, um, you know, things went no. <laughs> badly quite quickly. And it was Henry who picked up the pieces, really. 
Yeah, and you mentioned obviously that Arthur died when he was just 15 and a half. Um, so obviously he didn't have the time to become as well known as Henry VIII. But what role do you think uh, popular culture plays in fashioning these kind, these lesser known historical figures? And how challenging is it to change people's points of view once a certain image is kind of out there circulating? I think it's, it's almost, well, it is very interesting how that, that dynamic works because... Mm-hmm. There's an awful lot of um, reimagining or filling yes. in the gaps, yeah. which is plausible. And you have to do this even um, when you're writing history. You have to sort of stretch what evidence is there and see what's plausible um, and what's possible from it. Mm-hmm. So you you have the, these layers of study and layers of interpretation, which go right back over quite a few hundred years now. I think we still look at, at Francis Bacon's um, Henry the Seventh as a kind of first biography yeah uh, and that was written for charles the first when he was prince of wales as a kind of inspiration for what what good kings do um and that in a sense has colored our view of henry the seventh for so long and that was written in the 1630s and 20s so um mm-hmm. you know these things have a long life and obviously these days we've got well i suppose we had in in the past historical novels which add a lot of a lot more believable color and dimension to what might have happened mm-hmm. you've got a lot more historians who are looking for different angles to tell the same story yeah um, but the basis of this you've got the records which in themselves have to be mined for the key information to inform a lot of these discussions so and of course <laughs> so now we've also got um tv yes and we've got <laughs> a lot of a lot of shows which give people a sense visually of what past times were like Mm -hmm. accurate or not um obviously a lot of people think game of game of thrones is some sort of historical (laughs) setting which you know to some extent it has the elements which which are believable but i think it's it's mixed up quite a lot about how we view the past and versions of the past and i and i find even working with the records they are themselves a version of the past or Mm -hmm. a version of what happened linked to whatever the person who wrote those records wants to record Absolutely. or wants to pass on through the writing. So all of these bits of evidence, you have to really question who's writing it, what yeah. it's written for, what kind of audience is it meant to um, provoke a reaction in or um, inspire. Um, and, and if you can, you can read all of these things with a kind of balanced eye, you're not going to be drawn into making wrong conclusions or misinterpreting evidence or basically saying something which is which is not right. Mm-hmm. I guess the difficulty is that once these things are out in the world, you can't control who takes and uses that information. So I welcome the whole mixture of of all of this because mm-hmm. it makes people interested. Yeah. And the archives were certainly worried about about skills for the future and how how the records can be studied and will be studied. Um, if those skills aren't being passed on right. uh, between mm-hmm. generations. So it is it is quite difficult to get, you know, to the point where you can read the manuscripts and draw out the information, which could be for these high level stories of royalty and, and politics, or it could be for much lower level social history and local history. But the evidence has to be approached in the same way. You still have to be able to read the records. Yeah. So to find new, new things, those skills have to be there. But obviously once those new elements of new research are released and everyone can benefit from them and we have to we have to think about this progression or this kind of community of researchers and i think we're all part of it because we're all doing our bit Mm -hmm. to inspire people or to make um make historical stories either more understood or more accurately um discussed so i think there's no there's no harm in any of it unless people are deliberately trying to manipulate Mm -hmm. or create falsehoods which i don't think is happening anymore i think um if, if any errors are happening, it's through um, through the difficulty of the sources or the interpretation of them. And then now there's been some recent um, some recent information about you know misinterpreted key yes, sources yes. leading to a, a, a false conclusions, and mm-hmm. this is always a danger. But I, I guess the more we do to talk to each other and circulate our our research and discuss it in conferences, seminars, and festivals, then the more likely we are to to come to the right conclusions or at least the best conclusions we can come to because of the evidence we have. So I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for, for mixing things up mm-hmm. and taking account of what other people are doing and respecting what that research is because I guess 
ultimately we're all doing the same thing just in slightly different ways mm -hmm. so the past is there for everybody to explore and um we all have a role to be to be collegiate about it and um, and share and support each other yeah so true and I'm, I'm so glad that you said that and i love the community of researchers because i think that community aspect is is so important and we can all benefit from it so that's that's really great now i know that you're currently you're doing lots of things but you're currently making some final edits to a book on henry the seventh i believe for the penguin monarch series so that's right yeah yeah can you talk to us about the man behind the crown. I don't know. I find Henry the Seventh tricky too. I've spent so much time in Henry the Eighth's reign that he's always sort of old in my mind, and that's obviously not <laughs> right. So, what was Henry? What was Henry the Seventh like as a father, as a husband, as a friend? Like, can you share some insights about that with us? I think this is the aspect of, of Henry the Seventh which um, is the least visible. Yeah. But I'm hoping that um, a new project I've just been finishing um, called the Tudor Chamber Books. Oh yes, yes. Project is going to help us. I'll talk about a bit more about that if yep. we get the chance in a minute. Mm -hmm. But that's created a, a website of the of the personal accounts of the chamber, which mm -hmm. is really the, the financial um, engine house of the regime. But it also includes lots of the personal spending, and so we can see a lot more of of Henry the Seventh as a person, yeah. buying things, spending his time dicing and playing cards, and mm. basically in his room chatting to people. So it's put a lot more of the evidence of a the personality of the king back in the picture and i think this is this is what's been missing because so many of the books have looked at his his kingship and his achievements in stabilizing the country and building government institutions and basically extending his control like like a sort of spider mm -hmm. um, a bit like the happens but not quite um over the country so it's 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 presented him as a, a kind of remote and mechanical person who's not really involved with his family or his courtiers but i think that obviously can't be right simply mm -hmm. because no king could could rule in that way and survive for very long and obviously there's an element of that comes in at the end of the reign where his son arthur and his wife elizabeth are dead yeah. and he has to recalibrate how the country's going to to limp over the line to the next um the next tudor reign mm -hmm. so to get a teenage Prince Henry on the throne as a as an, a late teen or an adult, if that's possible. So, in that sense, looking back in the reign for more personality, it becomes it becomes harder, or it has been harder to find that. But hopefully, the new evidence that we've got on a, a, a lovely search engine will will allow people to search for the, yeah. the more personal elements of Henry's life. So, as a father, he's clearly um, he's, he's he's thinking on two lines. He's he's you know he's desperate for prince arthur's birth or an heir's birth certainly a male heir's birth mm -hmm. and the way he sets up the whole christening around the arthurian legend at winchester yes. uh, he's, he's basically expecting a male heir and obviously things could have gone so wrong in terms of how that propaganda would have been received um had he not been a male heir or he'd not even been born at all mm. 1486 so having had the son you know he he is over overjoyed but then immediately switches back into this idea of, of of looking to the future. So Arthur's not even taken back to London. He's left um, in the country to be brought up separately. Mm -hmm. So that obviously suggests he's uh, somehow not a, a loving or close personal father, which um, I guess it must have been a very hard decision for both yeah, parents. Absolutely. Um, but that's the kind of reality of, of what they were doing. They didn't have the luxury of, of taking the, the foot off the gas in terms of watching and, and being wary of the threats they faced. And this is clearly a time when the infrastructure is not in place to offer much resistance to any serious rebellion mm. or invasion. And certainly Richard III's sister, Margaret of York, over in the Low Countries, is already planning to try and unseat the Tudors um, almost as soon as they've got on the throne. So it's a dangerous time. And I think the mm. security aspect is always there in the background of any relationships Henry has. And clearly, it's uh, his marriage to Elizabeth is a almost an arranged marriage. Um, it's pronounced and expected it's going to happen before they've even met. But that's probably not too unusual in mm. terms of how how elite people negotiated marriage. Um, but there is evidence that they they lived very nicely. We've unfortunately we've only got one book of Queen Elizabeth's household records right yes, at, in her final yeah. year of life. Mm -hmm. uh, but from that, we can see her role in its mature stage, how she's actually 
a, a smooth political operator, how she's dealing with a lot of aspects of supporting the regime's maneuvers and politics um, through her own ways. And really, um, it's, a, it's a really important aspect of how their relationship works. And I think that suggests they've, they've come to a very comfortable arrangement about how um, the Queen's role is there with the Kings. And that obviously links to a, I guess, a more personal kind of attachment, affection. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were obviously happily together. There's no evidence of any wayward illegitimacy and yep. other children out of out of wedlock that Henry is, is fathering. There might be a, a Breton godson who could be a, a son he's had in, um, in his exile. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there's, there's nothing to suggest he was having any liaisons with, with courtiers um, in the way that Edward IV or Henry VIII did. Yeah. So that suggests a happy marriage. And obviously the children uh, are coming along quite regularly, but there's quite a few early deaths mm-hmm. um, as there always were so there's there's a constant um there's a constant family network around them which which with uh, margaret and and edmund being quite young in the 1490s mm-hmm. um i guess there's always a always a focus for family life which again we don't normally see because the records of the royal nursery are pretty scanty right. um but i think there's a there's enough evidence there of of passing on i think prince henry's prayer roll which has come to the british library fairly recently shows a lot of um the same sort of devotions that his father had right and we know henry gave this away in 1504 as a gift so you can see the connection there with henry um and his father perhaps um a bit more clearly because there there there's a follow-on from sort of breton saints and devotions that that the king had passed on to his son there in his his own prayer role so that's the sort of evidence which you have to pick up to suggest that there might be something we haven't noticed before in the relationship mm. um but clearly by the time henry is is 15 or 16 um you know it's that difficult teenage period and that yes. obviously is, um, <laughs> as a father that's not doesn't show a lack of affection it just shows the problems of trying to um to control someone who knows they're going to be king, knows yes, they're going to have a massive amount of wealth and power, but all already wants to have it in their hands. They don't want to have to wait, um, and that's that's a tricky time to be a father when obviously your entire um, future is in jeopardy because you have no wife, you have no prince who's mm. experienced. You have to try and rebuild things, and also at a time when all of his friends were dying off. I think this is a thing which hasn't really been picked up before that. Henry the Seventh relies on this very close group of friends who's almost formed around him before the Battle of Bosworth when he's in exile. Right. And he yeah. carries wow. these people right through the reign and they're given a lot of important jobs. A lot of them are experienced enough under Edward the Fourth and to some extent Richard the Third in doing the jobs that um, that gentlemen and nobles were meant to do, so running the counties, having their own households and their own focal points for, for being the king's representatives, but also being the, the guys who spent time drinking and, and playing cards with the king and when these deaths begin to happen in, in clutches and, and groups it, it does knock henry's confidence quite alarmingly and you mm. see him then being I- impacted by events so uh, in 1499 when when perkin warbeck is finally uh, executed and that that seems to be the end of things the next pretenders to pop up Edmund de la Poole, the Earl of Suffolk, mm-hmm. and uh, a Cambridge scholar called Ralph Wilford, um, whose story is, um, you know, it's a bit shadowy, but it seems to have turned he- Henry the Seventh's hair grey in a couple of weeks. Right. The thought of going going back to the whole um, battle against pretenders and and the threat of, of of disloyalty from within the corridors of power and the and the palaces, you know, that really has a massive effect on him, mm. a physical effect. So clearly he's a man whose emotions can really um, affect him. And I think we were only just beginning to to get a, a sense of that. And obviously the more the more research we can do, the, the more evidence of that will come up because we'll see it in letters mm-hmm. and we'll get the odd slip of, of personal opinion or, um, or evidence from other commentators about how the king was reacting. So we have to rely on a lot of it's on ambassadors' comments. It's obviously the Spanish and the French and the, the Italian ambassadors of various states are all writing back to their lords. And we get quite a lot of information about the functions and dynamics of the court, but also the the personality of the king from that, which is obviously written for 
the particular audience um, that these ambassadors are reporting to, and also some of the Herald's accounts of, of big state occasions. You can you can almost peep through the window and see them at their tables mm. having their meals and interacting. It's the nearest we might get to um, to seeing how they actually interacted um, as groups of people uh, and some of the dy- dynamism of individuals like like Prince Henry dancing at Arthur's wedding breakfast. Yeah, yeah that I love that. It doesn't really, I mean, it's frustratingly tiny as evidence, but it, it gives you a, a little glimpse of what we might assume these people were like it um, does, as yeah. individuals. Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned the friendship because I think in the sort of popular mind, Henry the Seventh doesn't have any friends, really. Like, you know, we hear so much about Henry the Eighth's friends you know charles brandon and all the men he, he jousted with but it's very different i think for henry the yes. seventh so that's great that you know that's being brought sort of more out into the light fantastic now you mentioned earlier sean that you work at the national archives you're the head of medieval records there could you talk to us a little bit about how people actually how historians how researchers actually go about looking into this period and researching it what are the some and what are some of the challenges you've touched on you know obviously you need to be able to read this stuff in order to to mine it but can you sort of go into that a little bit more yeah i think it's um it's really important to to see archives as being a resource for everybody yeah and that they're not just um a place to come and do high level scholarship i think we're we're trying to inspire people to come and use archives as a sort of cultural center mm-hmm. if that's not too heavy handed to yeah. say that you know the written record and the evidence of the past that's written down is as important as paintings and buildings and objects in in museums and galleries mm-hmm. it's obviously harder to to get that inspiration from it because quite often certainly in our collections they are written materials yeah. not not an awful lot of of colour and gold because they're the functional part of, of government. Um, but in that collection, vast as it is, are all the stories of how the crown or the state interacted with all of its um, component parts mm-hmm. and all the people that represented it and lived their lives, but obviously with with all of the courts and the money trails and um, and service records and you know all these things which capture people's lives because of the formal recording of them and the stages things like taxation um they all generated a paper trail yeah so the information is there for all kinds of different study and as you said that the kind of the gateway problem is is reading it yes (laughs) so we've been trying to um trying to work more closely with with universities and and offer training but a, a training program which is looking at um, different levels of skill sort of how to find things and how to interpret things and then maybe more specialist um, instruction on particular types of records like legal records or financial records so we've got a we've got a workshop coming up um, next month on medieval legal records where we're going to try and take take a group of students through how the legal system works Mm. how records of cases were presented not so much giving them exactly the information they want but trying to teach the the structure and the yep. context and the way that the machinery actually works and develops because learning the system allows you to then go anywhere you like mm. with the records because you know what the processes were in the past that created those records and therefore you'll know how to get out of the content of the records exactly what you want so that's the kind of approach we've been taking in in the very small medieval team that we have we're trying to um, to pool our knowledge mm-hmm. and actually make the collections um, link, often linked to these great stories that are in there. A lot of the the legal material is just full of, of personal information because people tended to overload their arguments with uh, all of this detail which they felt was important but which the lawyers didn't necessarily right. want. <laughs> but from that you get little snapshots of, of everyday life um, or personal information. In some cases, you actually get the records of people's document chests brought into court as evidence right. and then not taken away again. So in some of these courts, we've got um, we've got amazing detail of how people recorded their own lives in their own localities. Mm. Um, for example, in the Court of Wards, which is a court that existed from 1540 to the 1640s, um, really about... Um, heirs of people who held land from the crown yes yeah when they were underage you know and their wardship could be sold to somebody else um they could use this court and people could use this court to 
to challenge um, or to take cases against the estate anyway. Um, a lot of the evidence brought in there is um, is still in its original structure. Right. So we can see how people collected their records together. And in some cases, they've got documents back to the, um, the 12th century in right. their chests recording their land holding or letters or accounts. So these snapshots of... Um, of how people use documents mm -hmm. i think that's really interesting what personal archiving was so we're we're trying to make that that's part of the story of how the archives have come together over a lot of centuries mm -hmm. and the work that my predecessors have done is really around how we we enable access to that material so a lot of the work has been around indexing and putting summaries into print so the great series of calendars like letters and papers yes, yeah. that work was you know was, was done quite early on in the history of the archives mm -hmm. to, to stop people having to come to struggle with the originals but all of that work that's been done for maybe two centuries now is still just scratching the surface of what's available right okay. and we're kind of staggered by how much is searchable or how little is searchable through the, the catalogues, mm. how much has already been made indexed through paper indexes or inventories of, of collections when they were coming in. Because originally there was over 80 places around the country where these records were kept. So they're bringing them all together right. to the old public record office in central London required lists to be made in Durham Castle or Lancaster Castle of the records that were found floor to ceiling in, in dungeons and, and abandoned rooms. So that's where we've got some really good lists that have yet to be really worked through. Mm -hmm. And still got the legacy of that in terms of, of materials that have never really been brought into the light of day. So some things are still in, in original sacks or boxes that wow. we've never really had the time to, to open up and even see what's in there. So there's still a huge task to, um, to get into the, the medieval and Tudor collections and make them kind of fully, fully visible, um, mm. even if it's just to catalogue them by by date or by type yeah uh, and the percentage of what of searchable material as a whole is, is still quite small it's still probably down in the 20 percent that's with all of the census material and all the service records from mo modern times kind of considered as well so the the landscape of for research is still enormously fruitful mm. i mean there's still areas there where we are going to find amazing detail we're going to find individual documents that really change what we think about a particular event or a particular person and we'll also find collections which will, can make us think about bigger stories and change our minds quite quickly and all we need is to to get people into those documents and start to use them now i know there's a lot more now online a lot more digitized yes a lot of that yeah. is, is virtual reading rooms where the, the documents are sort of translated into the digital format and there's no context there's no search but you can research them from your your desk or your laptop mm -hmm. so that's great but the the fundamental there is still the uh, the skills lead needed to to see what's in the records but also to understand the the relationship between the records and the the processes that created them so i think that's really our role is to offer something on the history of how government worked and therefore what that evidence will supply to all different kinds of researchers because mm -hmm. all the people we study have come through the kind of crowns links at some point in their life and have left some element of paper trail behind them and that's sometimes picked up and it's sometimes been overlooked um but i i know that the opportunities are, are still there to find something about everybody in the tudor period that we're interested in because so much is still there to be used so it's a, it's a great challenge but also an amazing opportunity so contact the archives your local archives or any archives and 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 get working with the records because it takes surprisingly little time before you're you're confident about reading mm. the manuscripts and beginning to pick up how paleography the handwriting study works and how you can begin to understand what you're actually looking at it doesn't take long at all and it doesn't need special training really it just needs um determination and enthusiasm and a lot of people who listen to this you know this pod podcast already know enough about the history to be able to put that into the records as they're reading them so they will get the benefit and the, and the value from the documents much more quickly and that's what's really inspiring and interesting is that it's just how to we talked already about the sort of community of research. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think um, I think this is something which the digital world is going to allow us to to draw tighter together and to share um, share skills and, and techniques and knowledge much more readily. And some of that will be in the history side, some of it will be on the researching side, 
But I think the two things are very closely related and probably becoming more closely related because we can do so much more online. So that's um, that's the challenge, but also uh, a good opportunity for us all, I think. Absolutely. And that's so encouraging, I think, and to all the sort of budding Tudor historians and researchers listening today as well. So great. I've been trying to teach myself how to, how to read, um, but I find the early Tudor documents Yes, <laughs> very, very tricky. I was going to ask, I'm curious. So now when you read them, particularly earlier Tudor, because I find Elizabethan stuff is, is kind of easier to read. Do you, is, okay. are, you, are you just kind of, are you accustomed to it now? Or do you still, does it still sort of take you a bit a bit of effort to to um, decipher some of it? I think I'm, I'm very comfortable with the, the sort of official hands of, of the people who worked for the Crown. Right. Okay. So a lot of the, the clerks in the offices that wrote the warrants or the letters for the King were trained to write in the same way. Right, okay. And you yep. can even see the style of particular agencies or courts because their handwriting mm. style it doesn't change over centuries. So that's easy enough to learn. I think the difficulty is where you get personal handwriting, right, which yeah. is has been taught in a, a structured way at, at grammar schools or wherever these people learned. Yeah. Um, but then it, it sort of adapts this personality of its own as they get older. Mm-hmm. And that's where you begin to see some real quirks. And I'm convinced that people used to write on horseback or right. on ships. Because <laughs> some of the writing so awful. Think they must be jumping around when they wrote it. So I think for me that's um, that takes a bit more time right. um, to actually get into the say, the, the later 16th century as opposed to the later 15th century. It's mm-hmm. very different when you look at personal writing. But there's not too much surviving in terms of private letters from the earlier period, so yeah. we don't get a sense of how how that was developing. But, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing to try and decipher. And working on the inquiry desks at the archives, you know, people will come up and say, can you just help me with this? Yes. And bonk something <laughs> in front of you. And you have to try and switch into... What what period this is and what kind of wow. writing style this would be and how how those letters would have been formed at that time. So uh, the expectation of being able to read everything immediately is is there, yes. uh, but it's not, it doesn't always come out of your brain so fast. No. I'm afraid we've had oh, some real struggles uh, recently with sort of ambassadors' correspondence. Um, it's, it's fine if it's in English, but if it's in Latin or um, well, yeah, Anglo- that's the other challenge, isn't it? The Latin stuff. Uh, oh gosh. Because they, they tended not to, to finish their words with the right ending. So you right. have to sort of supply quite a lot of the text to get the meaning. But anyway, that's that's less of a problem than um, than just the fundamentals of, of reading what's what's there in front of you for a lot of people. They just want to get started. Yeah. So you, it's a... Uh, sorry, do you offer any online courses at the, with the National Archives for reading Tudor or medieval Tudor documents in particular? Yeah, we've got some Latin and paleography okay. online um, courses. Great. So they're sort of self self teaching in that we've got examples of records and then um, boxes where you can you can have a go at have typing it, yep. in the words. Um, oh, and we've good. refreshed some of those recently. So there's advanced and and basic levels. Mm-hmm. We're also trying to do um, more of our, I guess, more of our training skills will be going online mm-hmm. fairly soon. So we're, we're moving from a, a classroom based. Well, these are going to run in parallel from a classroom-based hands-on-the-documents session to things we can either take out to other archives mm-hmm. and work with their collections or things we can actually put up online and yeah. people can use digital images. I think there's a great buzz in actually handling the records. Yes, um, absolutely. But obviously yeah. we've got to do this in the stages so that if it's the skills you need, you have to basically start with what you can what you can work with. And yeah. then when you feel confident or comfortable about coming in and getting your hands dirty on the actual parchment and paper then that's yeah, great wow. because that's you you're ready for that and you're you're comfortable that your your journey is going to be fruitful i think a lot of people are worried about making the trip and finding that um they can't really work with the materials right yes it's yeah. a bit frustrating mm-hmm. so we want to try and help people before they get to that stage and so it, this is a, it's a good role for, for the archives to actually preserve those skills and to pass them on through these um, sort of online resources and that's something we're really quite keen to do that's fantastic. I love that. Now, you t- you briefly mentioned the Tudor Jam- Chamber Books project. Could you tell us just a little bit more about this? Yeah, it's um, it's it's sort of coming to an end in that we've we've got all of our data now. We've worked we're, well. Our researchers have worked very hard to actually convert um, about nine or ten books um, of of manuscript, which is about four thousand pages probably. Wow. <laughs> uh, so they've coded it into into. Um, 
to web web language, so it's fully searchable. Yeah. The University of Sheffield, uh, the Digital Humanities Institute at Sheffield, has um, has done the conversion and created the data. Uh, the project's been run through Winchester University with my former colleague James Ross down there. Yes. Uh, and what we've done, we've we've got the the records of the treasurer of the chamber in the formal account books, the final stage account books, um, which begin in 1486 and run to about 1521 when John Heron, who's the treasurer of the chamber, dies. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, even though the chamber is carrying on, the records don't either don't survive or we haven't found them yet. But anyway, there's there's these big volumes of all of the, right. the books of payments and the books of receipts. So it's the money coming into the chamber and the money the chamber is spending. And this is the sort of, it's getting towards a more personal level of spending. It's not quite um, the privy purse and the actual bags of cash that mm -hmm. courtiers had for the king and the queen as they travelled around, but it's it's still a little bit more of a personal aspect to it. Um, it's it's payments to to visitors, it's payments to, um, to jugglers and entertainers as rewards, it's gambling debts, it's um, people bringing in... <laughs> bringing in gifts like greyhounds at New Year. Yes, um, yeah, yeah. You can Fantastic. see a lot more of the the dynamic interaction of, of daily life. Mm. There's a lot, an awful lot about church ceremony and, and piety. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've digitised these in a way that you can, you can either digitally browse through the pages or do keyword searches. So it's a chance to... Um, to look for particular people or, or subjects, there's some subject tagging as well as um, as direct kind of markup for searches. So in these 4,000 pages, I think you've got an element of pretty much everything that the Tudors were doing. There's everything from warfare to um, to repairing the roof at Westminster Palace or yeah, wow. rebuilding Richmond. You know, there's there's so much there, and I think you know they've never been. It's never been possible to use them systematically before. Because you've got the the first half is always the d daily payments, so it's like a weekly list of payments um, that have come out of the chamber, for mm -hmm. example. So you'll see where the court is because the heading will have the the yes, place they're based that. at. Yeah, and then it'll go into what payments were made, and it can be you know one entry might be uh, I've lent a thousand hundred thousand pounds to the Archduke of Austria to stop my rebels, right. and the next thing could be to a, a woman who brought an apple pie for the queen. That kind <laughs> <laughs> so the scale of it is just uh, a bit mind-blowing, really. But that's the nature of, of how they worked. I think there was no sort of separation of responsibilities in that sense. I know Henry VII sets up a lot of different committees to look after bits of government, but a lot of the money for paying for all of that seems to just flow through the, the chamber as and when it came up. So in that sense, you get a, a sense of um, how haphazard some of it was, how unpredictable and... Um, an automatic the sort of mm. assumption you would pay for for something so small as a, a bunch of oranges one one minute and then um you know a load of cannon to go and fight scots the next minute so yeah. <laughs> you, you get a sense of how um of how the the money trails worked and how the processes worked and from that from what they're paying for you could begin to um put together a lot more of of how events um, were related to the kind of history we know so you can you can know about say the the war in france in 1513 and also the war with scotland at the same time there's quite a lot in there about catherine of aragon's role as captain general yeah and how she's um, getting the guns together to send up to scotland um and because of related records as well which we haven't put onto the website but we've we've been looking at you can really see how um how all the, the information is gathered together. So these chamber books are really important because they're the, the most detailed evidence of, of the, the personal space that the monarchs had responsibility for, um, but also how that space is also a public arena. So it's the court and how the court links to the localities and how these connections through communications and the sending and receiving, receiving of money, how that um, really lifts the lid quite a lot about on how um, lifts the lid quite a lot on how the government actually worked in reality. It's um, it's a great resource to, to play around with, and you yeah. always find something surprising every time you look at it, but it can also be used more systematically for the first time to, to investigate these particular aspects of, mm -hmm. of what was paid for or what was received. So um, we haven't really started to, to use it in the way it's meant to be used um, as we envisage it to be used because James and I are writing a, a book 
on this idea of projection and reception of, of early Tudor kingship. And in a way, we needed this resource to be able to ask some of those big questions right, okay. <laughs> about how the money trail reveals the links between the centre and localities and who is doing what and what the king is hoping to achieve and how that's sometimes resisted or pushed back by the people either in urban centres or in, in big noble houses. So it's given us a different way of asking questions, I guess, and hopefully getting slightly different answers about what, what Tudor kingship was, but also what um, what everyday life was like. Um, there's an awful lot about supplying the household and the people who were involved in, in London and even out in the forests, you know, supplying mm. deer or wood. Um, it, it really just give you a, a kind of concentrated view of, of the Tudor kings and queens and, and court at work and from that a little bit more about Tudor society as well I hope. Fantastic what an amazing resource and I love that it's there online for anyone you know anywhere in the world any from all walks of life to just go and have a look and do their own research that's so so fantastic. Now you mentioned another book I don't know how you're fitting this all in to be honest short but you um, mentioned another book that you're working on with James Ross um, I'd love to hear a little bit more. I know you've done. You, there have been some recent discoveries about how the Tudor regime set out to govern and also how they set out to destabilise Richard III's kingship in the process. Can you give us some little um, insight into that as well? Yeah, this is really just um, just shaping up at the minute. I've been, um, I've been looking at how... Well, we always, we always knew that there was a conspiracy against Richard III when Henry VII is over in Brittany and France. Mm-hmm. And obviously that conspiracy works away during Richard's reign in 1484 and 85 especially. And then the Battle of Bosworth comes along and Henry VII amazingly defeats Richard and yeah. becomes king. And to some extent, this was always um, a kind of given fact and it was assumed that it was it was done through some sort of um, mistake of Richard to charge wildly at Henry's forces yeah. Yeah. Um, and put himself at, at undue risk when he should have just hung it out there a little bit longer. But it always seemed to me that um, the hard work to get to that point was done before the battle was actually fought and probably before Henry even got into England at the start of August. Mm. And so I've been, I've been talking to, to Thomas Penn a lot about his, his new book, which is going to be on the, the three Yorkist brothers, right. Edward, George and Richard, and, um, and looking at how Henry and Richard might have actually sparred and, and faced off when he was the great, um, the great threat to Richard. Um, as Richard magnified his importance by offering these proclamations of all the bad things Henry Tudor would do if he ever became king, yeah. selling England to the French uh, and being being a puppet of somebody else. So this this raised this idea that there was some sort of mechanism in the conspiracy that we hadn't really appreciated or understood. So um, in the course of the, the Chamber Book's work, I was looking at a lot of the Exchequer records and be- began to find this evidence of... Um, a network of of targeting the kind of links in the money chain. Right. So who who is representing the king in the counties? How does mm. how does that kind of representation work? And the key people in this are the sheriffs who handle all of the the legal communications, but mm-hmm. actually bring in a lot of the money. Um, and suddenly there's this evidence of of a lot of the sheriffs being suspected of being working for Henry Tudor. Um, oh. And a lot of the money trails are either being frustrated or stopped or in some cases just taken completely. So Richard is, is losing his income oh, at a wow. time when he needs to be paying people to mm-hmm. be on the front of any invasion threat. And certainly when you jump to Henry VII's early months, you can see Henry sorting out a lot of these things which he's put in place when he was the pretender. But now he's king, he has to resolve because the exchequer as a machine just keeps moving forward in its processes mm-hmm. and is quite happy to to put the threat on, on all of these officers who haven't paid their money in. But Henry then explains, actually, they didn't do it because they were working for me. Right, um, gosh. Frustrating Richard. So we've got quite a lot of evidence we can join up, um, which is beginning to show this network of plotting and conspiracy and putting pressure on how Richard's money was actually moving around and how it could be put to the best use to to resist the what was a very well expected invasion. Mm. But Richard didn't know if it was going to be an army of thirty thousand um, or an army of probably four thousand, which is what did land eventually. Mm. So in that sense, it's um, it's fairly it's well it's very new. I'm still kind of working through it. Um, but reading the evidence with that 
particular point of view, you can start to pick up things which you might have missed before. So wow. these little comments about um, about warrants not being acceptable or um, the wrong people offering sureties and um, pledges for good behaviour suddenly become a bit more mm. suspicious, I guess. Um, so that might be where, as far as the evidence leads us, you're never going to get a statement to say, I was a spy for Henry <laughs> Tudor. <laughs> That's true. But yeah, there is some evidence of people saying, well, the sheriff um, couldn't pay his million because he was working on my commissions at the time. So there's you know, outright statements like that. And the more we look at it, the more we might find um, evidence of that. So I think as a as a sort of first step, there's enough to um, to make a, a talk about that. So I'm going to going to be talking about that at a at a conference in Lincoln in the autumn because um, the sheriff of Lincoln seems to be one of the key people in this. So right. I'm going to. So see if I can get it all lined up for that um, in September. Wow, that sounds intriguing. And when's the, the book expected to be published? Um, we're going to finish it hopefully this autumn. Okay. And then um, it'll it'll be out at the end of next year. Right. So okay. we're looking at um, James is sort of doing the the reception and I'm doing the projection. Right. And I think most, <laughs> most of the, the struggle will be try to find um, a way to to write the things that are going to be right in the middle. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's both, and we haven't quite worked out what we're going to do with that, but I think as we, uh, we put our chapters together, it should become clearer. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's, it's quite exciting that we can we can think again about how, um, how the government evidence can actually say something new about what kingship was and how it worked in the early Tudor period. Fantastic. That sounds amazing. Now, um, I'm kind of scared to ask because I don't know how you're going to fit anything else in, but what's next for you, Sean, after this? Are there any other books in the pipeline? <laughs> well, there's always there's always um, an idea or two because obviously sitting on top of all of these documents at work, <laughs> yeah, the, um, absolutely. the evidence is there to be to be mined. Yeah. But um, I have got a, a, a great story of a, a mid-Tudor embezzler, William Sharrington, mm-hmm. um, who is quite well known um, for his... He sort of came up through Catherine Parr's household okay. and um, got himself um, into the court life and was obviously a man on the make. Um, but we found um, quite a lot of his personal archive, which reveals um, his career as a as a courtier on the make, but also um, his sort of fall from grace. Um, the way he became rich was to basically get a job at the Bristol Mint and then to make his own money. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> there so you go. Making his own money, he was able to buy Laycock Abbey and turn himself into oh. a fine country gentleman. Um, wow. and, and there's lots lots more schemes going on. So I'd like to write um, write up his story in a bit more depth because it tells us quite a lot about um, the difficult times of the mid-Tudor period and how people navigated the perils of um, you know the Counter-Reformation and... Um, and the, and the pressures of, of the Seymour regime and not knowing what way things were going to turn. So how to insure yourself against that was to, to get money and land and hopefully hold out if you had to. But um, he did it all the wrong way around. He basically did it all through um, fleecing Henry VIII right at the end of his reign, right. um, being being forgiven and then falling falling down again. But in the course of that, the, the records, you know, they really reveal his lifestyle we've got lots of amazing inventories of his houses and all of the goods he had um and lots of letters personal letters coming into him from the people he was dealing with so there's a whole new level of information we can we can offer um because of the archive that's been found on what he did in his career and life um, and i think that would make a great story so i've been sketching that out and when i get um when I get some time, probably, yes. yeah, I'll begin to write that up. <laughs> that sounds fantastic. I love it. sounds like a great story. Now, I don't know, Sean, if you've listened to any other episodes, but I like to always end the episodes by playing what I call a little game of 10 to go. So it's just 10 kind of random questions for you. Um, so okay. are you ready for those 10 questions? I am ready. Yes. <laughs> okay, fantastic. So what is something that you love about where you live? I live in South London and I love Tooting Common because it's a great big green space oh, and you can go and be outside um, and meet lots of different people. So it's um, it's a great place to go. Sounds great. And what was a favourite childhood book of yours? Ooh, um, I guess one of the first things I really remember reading um, and really sticking with was probably The Hobbit. I think my oh, grandmother yes. bought me The Hobbit when I was about nine. Oh, and um, 
that's the earliest thing I remember being kind of blown away by. Yeah. I'm not sure why, because it was just a fantastic kind of. It was literally a fantastic story. Fantastic. Uh, <laughs> but I think it, it did. It did. It did stick with me um, for that reason that it was um, so unusual and so yeah. imaginative. All um, right, wonderful. It, you got sounds, me. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Uh, what was the last film that you watched? Uh, crikey. Um, I think I think we I think we watched um, what we do in the shadows because there's mm-hmm. been a, a new TV series in, in Britain right. um, based on that movie. So oh, we, we okay. went to watch the original movie, which was uh, which was hilarious. Okay. I really enjoyed it. Excellent. I like that. Now, what is I don't know if you have a bucket list, but maybe you could just think of something. What's something that is on your bucket list? I'd like to go to see the Northern Lights. Oh yes. Thank to you. go in in the right kind of time of year so mm. um to go to the north i've been to north north finland once and didn't see them because it was too cloudy oh. so i'd like to go again and um and yes i like the cold and i like the north the far north so um yeah. anything to do with mountains and forests and lots of snow um is fine by me but the northern lights would be an extra bonus <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. I'm a bit far from the Northern Lights. I suppose I should probably try and see the Southern Lights first <laughs> before I see the Northern Lights. I'll give it a go. So what is a favourite holiday destination? Well, the, fo- the favourite ones we've had have been to Cuba, Ooh, which was yeah, unbelievably good. Yeah. And that was quite a few years ago, so it wasn't um, it wasn't the same as it is now. Um, but I thought that was fantastic. And I also had a wonderful time fairly recently in Sicily. Oh, where. Nice. Um, Driving around, seeing that mixture of, of Norman and Roman and older material um, in the landscape and the stuff in the museums, uh, that was very, very enjoyable because it was lovely and warm as well. Yeah, lovely. Absolutely lovely. Now, do you have a favourite Tudor-themed, um, either a film or a series that you might recommend to people? Well, I've done I've done quite a lot of, of looking around to see what was and has been done. Yes. Um and there was, there was that bizarre 1970s um, TV adaptation of Henry the Seventh's Life, which is almost oh. unwatchable. Yes, but I think I know a... the one you mean. I don't think I could <laughs> watch much of it. <laughs> but that was a yes, that was very difficult to um, to sort of navigate and get yeah. through and get much from. Um, so I think I think I like um, I like Glenda Jackson as Elizabeth the First. Yes, yeah. I think you know that's that's a sort of balance between really good drama and an attempt to to present the history as they knew it at the time Mm -hmm. and I think it's very admirable for that I think a lot of the the more modern ones have have gone full on the entertainment scale and not not so perhaps concerned about (laughs) presenting some of the historical discussions and Mm -hmm. which you know people would think is is not quite so entertaining so um yeah I I kind of kind of look around a lot of them I would love to have one on um on the pretenders against Henry the Seventh, I think mm. that's a, that would be a really good story um, yeah, to dramatise. But that... at the minute, um, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not quite got um, to the Spanish princess yet. Um, right? No, I, I haven't either. There, <laughs> yes, I'm a bit scared that. actually. <laughs> I think, I think a lot of these things I have to sort of grit my teeth yeah. and um, <laughs> stop myself going, that's wrong, or that's wrong, exactly. that might be wrong, but I, I, I am, I, I'm not too popular at home when, when historical things are on TV and I start shouting. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. All right, so you can ask one historical figure a question and they have to answer truthfully. It doesn't have to be Tudor, but it might be. Who do you Ooh. ask and what do you ask? Well, I thought I would answer this by saying to Richard the Third, you know, did you kill the princes did in the you tower? Kill? Oh, yeah. um, but I, I guess that doesn't really get us any further because um, he probably would say, well, you know, give me a, an equivocal answer. Hmm. Um, I suppose I'd ask, I'd have to say, I'd probably ask Henry the Seventh about his how he put himself in the frame of mind of, of la- launching an invasion, mm-hmm. which he knew to be a suicide mission. Basically, I mean, he had no expectation of. Of winning, unless he was really confident that his conspiracy had put all of these points in place, which would secure his route and, and actually make it more likely. Mm-hmm. So, really, to be ask, to ask him how he um he's got his got his head into the right place to yeah. um risk everything on on a, an invasion, which I still think is one of the one of the most amazingly brave things that anyone could do in terms of um putting everything on the line yeah. and knowing that any kind of mistake he would be captured and and, and executed mm-hmm. straight yeah. away because Richard had had form in doing that in 1483 so it's um 
it's it tells you quite a lot about someone's um, motivation and determination if if that's the the basis for their entire their entire life sort of pivoting it's mm. either success or complete failure and death so he's He's, he's in that position of not having anything to lose but everything to gain and the, the pressure and the mental strain must have been huge but he he came through it and I think um, that would tell me an awful lot about 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 him as a person and all of the things he was then able to do once he had the ability to do it but it was all in that particular moment mm-hmm. so I'd ask him seventh how he he got himself ready and um, how he felt about that particular journey yeah, that's a fantastic question. I love that. Now, um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit here, Sean, because you mentioned the princes in the tower. So now I just feel compelled to ask you, um, who do you think killed the princes in the tower? Or do you um, think they were killed at all? I think they probably were. Right. And I think it probably happened quite early on in the story, probably before the end of the summer of 1483. I think the idea that they somehow were escaped and mm-hmm. then it wasn't proclaimed or publicized um because so many things were dependent on them still being around and everything sort of moved into place around that there's enough evidence of um people believing them to be dead mm-hmm. and then behaving accordingly uh, to suggest that they were dead i think um you're then into the realms of, of weighing up possibilities and probabilities about um about the candidates <laughs> ultimately you know they're in in their uncle's custody so Mm -hmm. the book has to stop with Richard but whether he did the deed I don't know I think there's some again it's part of recent digging there's been some interesting new evidence Uh (laughs) which uh, I'm not going to say anything about yet because it's it's just the first the first thing of a lot more stuff that's Mm -hmm. needed but some of it revolves around um around sanctuaries and um and other kind of rewards to people who are noted in the story Mm. um but it might not get us very far but it's another another thing to follow up i think everything everyone looks at james tyrrell um Mm. and his servants um who were you know picked up by thomas moore and then into shakespeare and perhaps um perhaps we've overlooked the accuracy of that i don't know so there's, there's a, I mean, it's a very, a very slippery answer, I know. But <laughs> don't worry, I'm a terrible fence sitter when it comes to the princes in the tower. I cannot make up my mind at all, so that's fine. So I look forward to um hearing more about that that you were just. Yeah, well, we'll see if we wait. can get anything out of it. Yes. All right, great. Now, lucky last, what is something you'd like to see more of in the world? I think we're all getting a bit ground down about how everyone is um polarizing themselves mm. and actually moving away from each other yeah. i think i work at a, a place where we have to work together mm-hmm. and we bring people in and to some extent it's um it's part of the government in britain right but it's the only bit of government people actually enjoy and have to come and engage with if they want to get anything out of it a lot of the other bits of government are necessities or yeah. um difficult things but the archives is is something which should be um there for everybody so i'd like to see um people thinking about collaborating a lot more and mm-hmm. being um less hostile to each other about what they're producing just in terms of um of research and how people's ideas are, are appreciated i think um it was interesting going onto twitter a, a few years ago when i first started um using twitter and thinking thinking what it would be and then seeing what it's become it's it's either mm. quite horrible or it's actually really lovely the way people come together and support each other so i'd like to see more of the support yeah and less the, the nastiness um and that, that's entirely possible and it's down to people being maybe pausing before they uh, hit send but exactly. thinking about um, yeah about working together a bit more would be nice so true love that response so so true um now before i let you go back to work i imagine you've got work to do and i'm just you know taking up all your time um the tudor takeaway that's the last thing so something for our listeners to to go and have a look at it might be a website a book to read a film to watch anything do you have a tudor takeaway for us well i've got something which um i i don't even know exists oh, okay. i think it might exist and it's um hopefully it's it's the kind of thing which um encapsulates the possibilities of research yes and why people should constantly do it. So um, I think in Westminster Hall in London, yep. there's a behind the plaster, there's a massive wall painting that hasn't been discovered. 
because when um, Arthur and Catherine got married yeah. in 1501, um, there was lots of repairs to all of the palaces, and they just finished building Richmond Palace. Right. Um, but actually at Westminster, they um, Henry VII painted or paid for an artist to paint a great big wall painting of, of the English hero Guy of Warwick mm-hmm. fighting his Danish giant Colbrand. And it's there in the accounts. Right. Um, it's paid nine pounds for it. And I think it was described as you know, a very fine and large painting. Mm-hmm. So somewhere in Westminster, under the layers of plaster, there might still be some medieval paintings that Henry VII put up there, um, <laughs> which haven't been found. And um, that's the kind of thing which the I records tell you existed mm-hmm. and there's a possibility of it still being there untapped. So... What I'd you know love to be able to do is is more of this where you you find evidence and then you go and look for it. Yeah. So the thing to take away is to sort of remember that what you see in the records were was created by people in the past. Yeah. And quite a lot of that, quite a lot of the element of that is still there in in current landscape or in current buildings. Uh, a lot of it's been moved to museums, but. Uh, the Tudor landscape is still there to be found, and um, I think it, ins- it should inspire all of us to get out and look for it more, um, using the the archives and the documents we know and the history we know, to go and hunt it down in the countryside, get out and about and look for your Tudors. I love that. I love go search for the Tudors, and now I'm going to be thinking about that wall painting. So thank you very much, Sean. <laughs> I've got that in my head too. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for taking time out of what I'm sure is an extremely busy day to chat and talk Tudors with me. I really appreciate it. No, thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family and click on the all-important follow button so you'll never miss an episode. It's time now for us to re-enter the modern world. As always, I look forward to talking Tudors with you again very soon. Mm-hmm.